Hi, everyone. Welcome. How's everyone today? My name is Diane Sharp. I'm the Director of Admissions for the Wharton MBA Program for Executives in Philadelphia. And thanks for joining us. Tonight's uh, topic is how do you balance it all with work and school and family? And we have an amazing panel tonight to share their experiences with you. Um, but first, I'd like to turn it over to my San Francisco counterpart, Barb. Good evening, everyone. I'm Barb Kraft, Director of Admissions for Wharton San Francisco. We're really excited that you're spending the evening with us. Thank you. Uh, looking forward to having a lot of fun this evening. We are one program, two locations. So Diane and I are now working hard to recruit our classes, both Philadelphia and San Francisco. We're one admissions team and our application deadlines are early December and early February for a class that'll start the end of May. So we start our cohorts, San Francisco and Philadelphia together, the end of May, for one week orientation in Philadelphia main campus. And then from there, we go every other weekend for the two year period. And it's definitely a juggle, which your, the panel this evening will share with you and all of their insights and advice on how you manage that juggle of a full-time MBA and at the Wharton School and the executive program, it is the same full MBA as our full-time MBA program. In no way is it MBA light. It's the same number of credit hours, it's the same number of contact hours, and it's the same faculty. And the way we fit that in is we do have Every other weekend, all day Friday, all day Saturday, we require that our students continue to work full time while they're going through the program. And we also have some one weeks built in there, that first upfront one week orientation. In the first year, a little later in the first year, actually the Philadelphia class comes to San Francisco for a one week marketing simulation course. And year two, we integrate the two classes again for our global business trip. And in that case, our students get to choose from a number of different locations and the Philadelphia and San Francisco students merge together for that particular one week course. Now, um, we do ask that upfront, you decide which coast you're applying to, San Francisco or Philadelphia, but year two, there's a ton of flexibility. You can take classes on either coast. We have a lot of different events coming up for you to learn more about the program. But tonight is learning about how to manage this juggle. You can put your questions right into the chat function and hopefully we'll get to everyone that we can. Diane? Yep, thanks, Barb. Yeah, we look forward to getting your questions. Um, we're gonna kick things off by having our panelists introduce themselves, give you some background where, where they come from and when they graduated. So we're gonna start uh, with Liz, please. Hi everyone, good to see you tonight. I'm Liz Tamaro. I live in Malvern and I attended the Philadelphia campus and program. I'm a Wemba 42, so I graduated in 2018. I work at Vanguard and I have three kids, Jack who's six, June who is four, and Josie who is one and a half. Thanks, Josh. Hey, uh, one of the candidates. My name is Josh Kristoff. Uh, I am at the moment in Jacksonville Beach, Florida, where I recently relocated temporarily, hopefully a little bit more permanently from San Francisco and uh, Silicon Valley area. I graduated in May, so a Wemba 44, class of 2020. I work at Meraki, which is a business unit within Cisco Systems, headquartered out of San Francisco. I manage a team of technical program managers. Uh, my family situation is I am uh, married almost 10 years to my wife, who's a, a Googler, soon to be Facebooker. And uh, we have three kids, seven-year-old Vienna, five-year-old Conrad, and almost one-year-old Catalina, who, since she's almost one, meant she joined us in term five of the program, which was coincidentally my highest uh, academic term. <laughs> Hi, I'm Chrissy Braidenworth. I was in the same class at Josh, so just graduated from the San Francisco class in this past May. Um, I work at a genetics company, so when I enrolled in the program, I was working at the same company. We we're consumer focused. During the program, we shifted to also 
helping with research and then most recently COVID testing. So I've been busy getting our COVID testing stood up and there's no time um, like the present. And my family situation also changed a lot during the program. I was engaged when I was applying. So, you know, it's true love when someone's willing to propose when you're studying for the GMAT um, and then got married at the beginning of the program, which was uh, fun and stressful. And then had my daughter in uh, our second year. And as Josh mentioned, mentioned funnily enough, I also was my best academic term as well. <laughs> Thanks. Aris. Yes, hi, my name is Aris Bro. Actually, I, I graduated from a program about five months ago. I was on the East Coast and um, I did the program with my wife at the same time. So that was something a little bit particular about us. And uh, I think she's here. She will come and say hi. And um, we have two kids uh, about um, basically age 15 and 13. And um, uh, for, uh, we live in Connecticut, Greenwich, Connecticut, and I've been uh, doing finance, specifically commodity derivatives, for the past uh, 10, 12 years. And um, I have to say that the program was very interesting because of um, having to uh, balance um, a family with a spouse that is also in a program and kids. But it was very, very fun and very interesting, and it was we had a great time. Thank you. Out of curiosity, and I'm sure many people on the line here wonder, how is it that you all made the decision at this particular time in life to go back and get an MBA? I think for me, there was um, there was never a clear moment in my career to step out for two years and do a full-time program. So I always felt good about the decision to not do that but the desire to have an MBA never went away. And several years before I applied, I learned about the Wharton program in San Francisco and it seemed perfect for everything that I wanted to do, but still a very scary step to take. But in the meantime, I watched lots of other friends do MBA programs and you just realize that two years is gonna come and go no matter what. Um, two years is gonna be busy, two years is gonna be stressful for the types of jobs and goals and ambitions that people have in this program anyway. But if, if I went through the program, two years would come and go and I would have an MBA and, and that put me in a better place to pursue my dreams and, and just be able to continue growing. And I work in an industry where I'm surrounded by a lot of MBAs from top schools. And so just felt like as I continue on in my career, that's my competition so felt it was important to to get the credential and the learnings yeah sure i'll i'll contribute there um so at, earlier in my career i um, studied a lot and earned some additional financial designations and i was a, a leader a formal leader at vanguard but i was looking to complement those financial designations and credentials with some formalized um, academic learning and leadership and so I'm a learner, you can probably just gather that. I love to love school. Um, there's a lot of great institutions around the area, um, but I was pretty committed that if I was gonna spend the time, I wanted to do it, do this right, right? I wanted a challenging program. And I wanted to, you know, go to, to a top a top program. Um, Chrissy, I love what you said about sort of like the two years come and go. You know, it's, it's a tough decision, right? And it's, it's definitely one that's great for your career, but um, challenging personally, definitely rewarding. Um, and I remember that as I was thinking about that, I have an aunt who I'm really close to and she looked at me and um, I guess I was what, 34 when I was applying and she said, all right, two years, you'd be 36 when this is over. Would you rather be 36 with an MBA or without one? And I was like, oh, I guess I'd rather be 36 with one. Like, let's go here. Here we are. Right. And so you just kind of I made the choice. It was a family decision for sure. but. Um, you know, once I sort of committed to that, never looked back. Any of the guys want to contribute? Sure. Go ahead, Art. Go ahead, go ahead. Well, yeah, sure. In my in my case, it was my turn. Uh, my wife had just finished being the commencement speaker for her MBA program. And then two weeks later, uh, I was starting at Wharton. Uh, Wharton in particular for me was, uh, you know, the quantitative rigor. It was the only program I applied to, and I would have reapplied if I didn't get admitted because uh, it was that important to me. Um, and then again, when you have something that seems like that's the right career move for you, um, and Wharton, uh, you know, looking back on it, I couldn't have imagined that it would have been as good as it was. 
uh, I think in particular for me, why uh, MBA beyond all that was uh, my wife and I were both naval officers beforehand, and we had just gotten our feet wet in the tech industry uh, starting four years ago. And so for us, this was uh, much again like Chrissy, looking at the places we wanted to be. Um, it was a lot of pretentious top tier MBAs in a lot of cases, and I say pretentious kind of in jest, um, but but there really is a a pretty amazing uh, reason. Uh, to, to want to be a Wharton alum uh, and, and what that means. Uh, and, and certainly, you know, you think of it as all those pretentious things, but it's it's really the friendship and network uh, and, and education that I found, uh, which is actually what a lot of people told me the MBA was not about, um, but in my case, and I think in our, our class's case in particular, Christy, uh, on the West Coast, we found, you know, kind of a magical experience there, so. And I guess, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, okay. And I, I, here is my, 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 my spouse, effectively. We did a program together, and I have to say that one of the biggest drivers for me doing the program was because she wanted to do a program. So when she was applying and uh, studying <laughs> for the GMAT, I just decided why not. We had done something similar when we got our graduate degree, and uh, she was in medical school, and I was doing a PhD. So we decided that we have done it once. We didn't die back in the days, back in the day, so we can do it again. <laughs> Hi everyone, good evening. Hi EJ, and for those who are in the healthcare industry, you're gonna see EJ in two weeks for our healthcare webinar. Absolutely, um, EJ Camille, I just graduated, I'm the regional medical director for Team Health. Been in healthcare for however many years now. Um, great thing about having done this together is we don't know what to do with our time now. <laughs> I bet. You figure out how much time you have in a day, it's a lot. You're going to see everybody. Good luck. <laughs> Thanks. Great. So um, you've shared why it was important for you to earn an MBA for your career. So let's layer that. So um, three of you already were parents, um, and one of you was becoming engaged. Um, so how how did you plan to do this with families? Uh, you, there's a lot of planning without families, and how did you make that? happen and, and still make the decision to move forward. Yeah, sure. I can start there. Um, so when I, I when I was studying for the GMATs, um, I had one child. I found out very quickly after I was going through that process that I was pregnant with my second. Um, and then, I, as I said, or I might not have said this um, to this group, maybe it's just ahead of time. She was born um, a few weeks before I found out I was accepted. So I started the program with a two-year-old and a, and a two-month-old. And so before I decided to, to fully jump into this, you know, it's, it really is a family decision. Um, it was um, something that was important to me personally and professionally, but, you know, a decision that I didn't make on my own. I involved my husband, clearly. He sort of understood the um, expectations that were going to be put on me from work and from school. But it was even beyond that, right? Like the support has to come from just sort of, for me anyway, more than just my immediate, under my immediate roof. My um, mother-in-law lives close by. My mom lives an hour and a half away. And so we were also in the middle of building a house, which my husband was is in construction and was kind of trying to spearhead all of that. So it's just a crazy time. But we involved, I told you about my aunt, like we involved, uh, you know, all these people around us, family. And then um, we had to, you know, buy help too, right? So we had someone help us with the kids. Um, my kids spent the, you know, a lot of those Wemba weekends at my mom's house. They would kind of go out on Friday afternoon and they were, you know, little and transportable. And then Sean would pick them up on Saturdays. We'd kind of come back together on Saturday afternoons. And so not every weekend, but it allowed him to sort of, you know, he had priorities too. He needed that time to work on the house and do his job. And so it was really a decision that we made collectively. Um, and then I think, you know, as with anyone, with professionals, people who are in relationships, it's always about communication. So like talking to each other about like, what's going on for you this week? Do you have school this weekend? What's he got going on this week? How are we going to kind of make this work, readjust? And, you, you know, sometimes you have to do that by the hour, by the day, by the week, by the month. So that's sort of how we approached it. Chrissy, I think you're muted. I am on mute. Thank you. My husband has an MBA, and it was one of the most 
rewarding experiences of his life. So most of our social circle were his business school classmates. He attributes a lot of his professional success to the network and education that he got there. So as soon as he was on board with me going as well and just remembered everything that he got out of the experience and then trying to unpack why he wouldn't be supportive. And some of that was, does this delay our family planning our Mm -hmm. life together? So a lot of it was thinking about, well, how can you make this work? And so for us, it was looking at, when we set our wedding date, there was an ideal date, which actually was a class weekend, which had I known I was accepted, I wouldn't have done, but I'm like, I'm not turning my back on that day and then not getting in and forever hating the first choice weekend for my wedding. So that was one of the only weekends that I missed for school. And then we decided like there, if we thread the needle, there's this perfect time in between when we have the marketing week that Barb mentioned, where the whole class comes together on the West Coast. I didn't want to miss that. I didn't want to miss our study trip and I didn't want to miss graduation. So within that, we had like a few times where we could have a kid and felt like it would be a really good time. And it ended up working out. And, um, and with that, to everything Liz said, we had a community to support us. So both the Wharton community was very supportive. We had a room on campus where, and, and just, I, I had an ideal date where I would have her as well. It was a weekend I knew I could miss class and then had a full two weeks between a class where the professor basically had told us she had been in an accident and discharged herself from the hospital in order to make class. So she had very high expectations. So I knew when I could have her and it would be great. And she was born that day. And two weeks later, we were back on campus and Wharton had given us a room where my husband, mother, mother mother-in-law all rotated through having the baby there. So for the first two months, I got the best of all worlds where I had, I was able to go into class. I was able to be with classmates and didn't have sort of that uprooting life, but then also had a baby there. And it was just an incredibly welcoming community. And then also for our for study trips and all the sort of travel and things that you have to make work, my husband and family was there to to pick up. And I hope you don't mind me telling this, Chrissy, but it's my understanding that you went into labor during your presentation and finished (laughs) finished out the class weekend and then went to the hospital. Yeah, I didn't realize it at that day. And then walking home and uh, I, I guess I had I'm first child didn't know what labor felt like and then didn't make it through dinner when I got home um, and didn't have time to text people of like why I wasn't in class the next day. So on the other side, I think I checked my phone and everyone's like, you have a baby in your arms. Um, <laughs> but just an incredible experience. And I would also say how much closer that brought me to a lot of classmates. I I've always loved children and families and felt close to classmates, but having had a child and having that in the program, it was just the parental advice from logistics and just support and that connection was incredible. Nice. I guess for, for me, what I want to add is uh, because this was almost like the second time we did it, we did something a little bit more drastic when um, when we had our first child, EJ was starting uh, medical school and I was actually in a PhD program. So we, we have learned uh, from these days how to organize ourselves. And the trade-off that we discovered was like effectively with discipline and focus, you end up having a little bit more time that people who don't have kids because you really prioritize things and you, you can really uh, get a lot more done correct because you have a lot less um, uh, distraction. So this time around, the kids were a little bit older. So actually, it was a very good and positive uh, um, thing for us to be uh, actually uh, studying and having some homework to do and project to do because we could involve them and actually also lead a little bit by example. So I know that on the weekend when we uh, we came back on Sunday, for example, all of us will actually sit around the table and and do all of the homework and everything. So that's that's something that I actually wanted to add. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Right. And it is a residential program. So when students do come to class every other weekend in Philadelphia or San Francisco, in Philadelphia, they're staying at some of the local hotels and also the executive conference center. And in San Francisco, our campus is right along the Embarcadero at the base of the Bay Bridge. So students are staying at La Meridian which is just a few blocks away. And this is whether you live right in the city or you live in you know, Texas, all of our students do stay at, at the residence, either Philadelphia or San Francisco, and families are welcome to join them there. 
And I'm real curious, um, with the panel, how did your family get involved during the two years of the program? Um, I, our, our class managers do plan events and things like that. And I know students and, and class members plan events too to integrate families and partners and significant others. I think for, for my family, we had a precedent because we were, I was so integrated into my husband's business school class. So I had the same expectations for him. So he stayed with me at the hotel over the weekends. There's a, the hotel sets up a really fun pub that we call Wharton Pub. Um, so he was at Wharton Pub, got to meet other significant others, um, little trips and social events that we would go on on non-class weekends, like ski trips. He would also come and was involved in there and then after we had our daughter um also classmates were just welcoming and warm and she would come pick me up from class on saturday and classmates liked getting to see her and hold her so they felt very welcomed and involved that way yeah i mean chrissy brought her whole family to sweden for the global trip so so that's another notable way to integrate the family. Um, you know, I, I guess I'd say in my case, you know, maybe to to present like almost the entire opposite side of the spectrum here is, uh, I mean, for how we manage the Wemba program with our families, we just drew like really strict lines on basically when I was unavailable for the family. And that was from Friday morning uh, until Saturday afternoon. And uh, it was usually maybe I'd stay like another hour or two after the class, grab a beer um, when it was pre-COVID and, and hang out with folks before going back home. Uh, I lived in the city at the time, so I'd either run or catch a bike there um, or it was a train afterwards when I moved south. And uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think it was the family time for me. I, di I didn't want to miss out on that. And I think for my wife, managing young children and bringing them on site. Uh, trying to get to know people in that type of environment was just kind of a lot and it's already exhausting. So in our case, we really just drew those lines. Um, and I think she was just a little exhausted with her just having finished her MBA program and she wanted more than anything to watch Game of Thrones on a Friday night and I didn't care about the show. <laughs> so that was perfect for her. And I guess uh, Downton Abbey was another one. So, uh, so so in our case, I mean, that that is presenting the opposite side. I mean, there was... Uh, there were a couple events where, uh, you know, one of the one of our classmates held a a big party down at his um, <laughs> sizable home in San Jose, and our family got together there with a bunch of other families, and so that was a really nice event. But it was also easy because the kids could run around and and be engaged with other kids. So, and for us, effectively, it was also very interesting. I think the two aspects of the program that were very good was that effectively. We spend the weekend night, so Saturday to Friday to Saturday, actually, on campus in the hotel. So it was a little bit good for maybe setting up some of these um, lines between uh, when we are studying or we are with a Wemba family versus when we are with our families. And because the kids were a little bit older, it was a little bit easier to find uh, help. We're always worried that when we come back home, the help would kind of like <laughs> give up on us, but it never happened. And then the second thing we did was we involved the kids on all of the trips what we did and we traveled quite extensively so what we usually do is like we go with them maybe before they will come and join so we went to uh, india we went to uh, argentina and we did a lot of trips with them and also when they were not in school they will actually come and spend the weekend with us at uh, on a campus in wharton and they really loved it and it was a very great experience for them to be able to spend some time on the campus and i can speak for the staff but i know um my favorite events are the family events. We plan them once a year, um, formal ones, and there's always families around other times, but we just enjoy seeing the kids come on the campus. It's a great way. So, and keep posting your questions. We do have one. Um, we have several, but let me ask this first one. So, um, we've been asked uh, if you would share uh, basically study tips. So, you've got your family, you've got your work. Um, how do you fit in studying? Are you doing it while you're traveling to campus? How did you make that work? Did anybody study? 
you know the answer there uh <laughs> no it's you know I, th I think again it's all about drawing lines right so uh i i mean for us and, and i think actually another thing just before jumping into this that was uh important to mention is uh, our family had an au pair and i think that answers a little bit of the question of like how do you do all this like you know i mean my wife is you know super impressive and fantastic but like you know, we were nothing without having an au pair uh, living with us to help support the family during that time. So I do think that's an important like nod to uh, to, to dual working parents and, and how to make it happen. Um, as far as the studying, I mean, the I think it you know Wharton claims is twenty to twenty five hours a week, and and there's probably you know some fluctuation above and below that. I, I mean, my uh, median study week with a, a nice standard deviation around it was definitely not that high um, but for those moments where it needed to be a little bit more like term one kent smetter's microeconomics midterm and and final uh you know i'd be getting up at five in the morning and studying till seven before getting the kids lunch packed and walking them to school and then coming home from uh from work and getting everybody tucked in and in, in bed and then you know jumping back on the books uh, I, I didn't do that every week by any stretch. Um, I think one thing that I would receive a decent amount of feedback on from classmates, uh, and I think a lot of this is a product of having gone to a service academy and spent time in the Navy, is I was pretty well calibrated to like where I was gonna fit. And I pretty much held that program for the entire program uh, with very little deviation. And I think a lot of people over indexed on term one, term two, wanted to grab that 4.0, they were used to being top of the class. And um, like, like one of the professors says, uh, you know, in your opening week is, you know, bad news, guys, half of you are below average. So, um, and that's new for a lot of people. Yeah, I'm, I'm probably the opposite of Josh of a really bad example of how to study for the class that he mentioned. But I think there it's thinking about what you want to get out of the program and what you want to get out of each class. And there are classes like microeconomics where you can't just sit down and cram for it. It's working problems, it's practicing. So for those types of classes, it was trying to carve out a little bit of time every day and getting reps versus uh, you know a big stretch of time. And there were other classes where you're doing papers with a project where it was really helpful to get a, a block of time on a Saturday. And from a family perspective, we just committed to getting a babysitter every Saturday. And that meant when I was in class, my husband had some time to do things on his own and got some personal time. And the weekends when I was home, it meant I had time to focus on school and not be worried about the imbalance of childcare and shifting there. I guess maybe for us, what we did was we had a, a schedule that was more or less the same for the two years. And it was really around the Sundays. I can't really do any work uh, at during the week because of the type of work that I do working on the training floor. So we start early, we finish also sometime late. So it was really the weekend. So when we were on the Wemba weekend, basically uh, waking up early Saturday morning and also Friday night for the group projects. And then uh, always on Sundays, basically systematically on Sundays. And so that was the Sunday was study time for everybody, including the kids. So, and then also I want to, uh, also, I like the point that Josh mentioned that effectively for us also we had an au pair, which was also one way for us to be able to go and uh, uh, organize and ourselves around the demand for the programs. And I have to say that uh, depending on the background of the student, I had a background in engineering and uh, a technical uh, quantitative background. So some of the classes that really took me a lot, a lot of time were actually the basic introduction accounting class. And it was very different from what I've done before. So that's a good thing also having a study team and also having different background means that effectively will tend to spend time on different topics and uh, which will tend to be happening at different time during the, the, the year. So because uh, some of the classes that were tough for me were actually first term and then second term and for other people it was the first term. So. And I'll just I'll just add, I mean, I have a, you have four people, you're going to get four different approaches, you know, hundreds of students, hundreds of different approaches. I was always the freshest right after I got home on Saturday afternoon. And so I would, you know, spend some time with the kids and then I would dig right in that Saturday evening. Um, and I my my um, 
learning team called me a procrastinator. I didn't even know that that was a thing, but like, I like to like get it all, get it all down and out and like get ready. And I front loaded everything to like the, that first week because I didn't want to be cramming the second week. I'm not an early bird and I'm not a night owl. Um, I, I protected my weekends. So I was more of like a every weeknight when the kids were in bed, they were littler at the time. So in bed at 7.30, you know, 7.30 to like a 10.30 um, kind of thing, just regularly every night. But I think, you know, what you're hearing is again, four people, four different approaches. The most important thing is not what we did. It's like what you prioritize, what will work for you, how you're going to fit it in, what you can sustain. Josh sort of said that like what he did was very sustainable throughout um, and sort of how you adapt and flex. And some of that could be could be trial and trial and error, particularly if your family life or your um, your sort of your personal life evolves while you're in the program. And that's a perfect lead into one of the questions that was posted: was how did re you recalibrate from year one to year two? Were there things that you learned in year one that made you do things differently in year two? And for me, like year two, I was definitely a little bit more relaxed. So I didn't, I no longer had a newborn. I now had a three-year-old and a one-year-old. Um, and so I, I just was, I think, approached it with, um, I don't know, a little bit more of a relaxed attitude and you sort of have settled into a rhythm. And at that point, you really have some strong relationships with your study group and your colleagues and um, you know, for me, I was, I was having a little bit more fun and not feeling bad about it, you know, not feeling like I'm missing out on this time with my kids, but more sort of reflective of, hey, I'm setting a really good example for them, sort of what it means to be a working mom and committed to education and, and like, oh, by the way, like this is, this is not like me leaving my kids, this is me investing myself and that's, that's really powerful. So I would say for me, um, I think um, I, I do think some of those courses we were talking about earlier in, in the first year, like they are a bit more um, rigorous, at least they were uh, for me. Um, so I think I relaxed a little bit into the second year. I think I agree with Liz. Some of my approach was just based on year one, you're focused on core. A lot of that is pretty heavily quantitative. And then year two, you're choosing your electives. And so that is you know, more thinking about either what you want to learn because you're trying to build through your weaknesses or you're trying to build your strengths. So my approach to year one, I think, especially in the very beginning was survive. Um, I was so out of practice for studying. Um, there are quantitatively rigorous courses. And so I relied on my study group a lot. Um, I relied on resources that the school had. So people who are just there to support you and help coach you through how you're how you're going to make it. And by the time I got to year two, I had the experience of year one behind me and a good foundation. Plus, we were going into electives. And so there were some things and, and I chose to focus really on building my strengths in year two, where some people are looking for a career change and and may have a different approach. So I think there were some fundamental differences in it, but that was one of the changes that I made and it, it does make you a little bit more relaxed. And I was also able to apply a lot more of what I was learning to my job, to my personal conversations. And so that made a lot of the curriculum come alive for me as well. I, I have to say that I was a little bit um, surprised and in a, in a good way in the sense that, so when I started the program, I actually assumed that because I had a technical background and um, 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 I, I had an engineering degree and also a PhD in applied statistics. So I was thinking that, okay, I should be able to, let's say 25 hours, but I should be able to do it in less and then get it done quickly. And I was really, really uh, very quickly surprised because as I was saying, effectively, yeah, it's true that on some of the classes, you have an advantage based on your background, but on other classes, you're actually starting from really from scratch. So after a big adjustment and actually getting into the, the process and the habits of studying steadily and also finding some time to fit in the time needed to work on some of the group projects because for the first year we have a lot of group projects in our study team which was one of the great aspects of the program. I have to say that year two became also even more of a challenge but for different reasons because I changed job in the program and I actually started working in, in one of the big SH firms that had even more drastic uh, requirement in terms of work hours. And so for this, what I had to do was effectively switch a little bit and start taking 
some of the classes where I had a background, so a little bit playing to my strengths a little bit. And then also, I, I love some of the electives where you could travel. So in three days or in a week, you could actually fit in um, the full classes and actually get also both the experience of going to a new place and also being a little bit closer to some of your classmates. So that's, that's really what I did for the second term. I'd say for a second turn in the term in the context of or second year in the context of family life is, you know, I mean, I, I was had a pretty good study program, but like, you know, my, you know, my wife was seeing diminishing returns of Game of Thrones Friday night. So uh, I, I think it's, you know, being mindful of the impact on family and like, like all of us, I think alluded to at one point is, you know, connecting with your significant other. Um, you know, your kids as much as possible and explain one in it, like in Liz's case, like, hey, mom's investing in herself. And, you know, if you can remember that mom was doing school and work and being a full time mom, like that was hard um, So kind of trying to connect with your family. in as much that way, um, I, I think is really, really important. And so uh, for those folks that over index on year one or even if you didn't um, on, on time spent is this is a balance uh, and, and there's no way you will balance all the things of your life that you want to effectively here. And so, I mean, I used to play soccer every Tuesday night in the city. I stopped doing that. Um, I ran to work and bike to work instead, uh, you know, with, with the kids, uh, I was refusing to sacrifice that time. And quite frankly, my grade would suffer if I was going to miss a weekend activity. I almost always did not touch a weekend. I was like one weekend was for Wemba. And then, and then, you know, I would love to have that Saturday afternoon and Sunday because it was my time to reconnect with family. And the next weekend was fully for the family um, when, when I wasn't at class. And that that was my approach. It was the right thing for our family to do. Um, it was the right thing for me to do. I mean, because spending time with them keeps me energized. And I think, again, that's how I kept it pretty consistent. And I think she ran yeah. out of Game of Thrones episodes. <laughs> Josh, similar. I thought a lot throughout the program and before when I was thinking about applying to Ruth Bader Ginsburg's advice on this. So she went through law school with a young child and she attributes her success in law school to being a mother and the fact that she was completely focused on one when she was doing that and then completely focused on the other. So not trying to multitask and then one becomes a respite from the other where you get energy. So totally agree with that. And I wish I had Liz's energy on Saturday after class, but I took a nap and then Saturday night was date night. So I would do whatever my husband wanted to do to try to make up for, for especially those days leading up to class because I'm more of a crammer. And then when my daughter was born, I would carve out time. So when I was with her, I was with her and tried not to mix it too. And this leads into another question we got, um, actually a very practical one. How did you keep the energy up, especially for the new mom? Like it's a long enough day and you guys have described how long your Fridays and Saturdays are, but what kind of tips can you give to, to folks about just energy and health? Yeah. I mean, it's, this is a little counterintuitive, but when you were there, like that was some of the most peaceful time I had. I mean, I... <laughs> Um, I had an eight week, eight week old at home. And for that first week, similar um, to Chrissy, my husband was there um, with the baby. So, you know, with the whole nursing, it was kind of, he was helping me out with that. And I wasn't have to going back and forth. And, but no, once like, you know, once I had a 12 week old and a 16 week old, when I got there, <laughs> I actually got a few minutes of peace and quiet. And so, um, and I was very intentional with that time. So some of that was like for me to recharge. Some of it was like sneaking in the one workout for the week. And other times I was studying and preparing so that when I got back home, I didn't have to do that. Um, I, so, you know, I, I didn't anticipate it to be that way. Like, hey, this is a sort of a peaceful, um, you know, you know, Friday evening um, all by myself <laughs> kind of a thing. And then I was just saying about the energy. Um, I don't know. I don't. I just I have a lot of energy. I don't I don't know what else to really say about that. Like I said, though, I'm not a night owl and I'm not an early bird, but um, I just I just just sort of who I am, I guess. Yeah, I think there's a, a certain amount of energy you get just from the program. There's so much intellectual stimulation and you just I work in a like I have an incredible work environment and it's still not the same of being surrounded by professors and classmates. And it's 
if you look at Wimba compared to traditional programs, this is the thing that shocked my husband is the access that you have with your professors. You can sit down and have breakfast with them. And these people are brilliant. And so getting to spend your time with this cohort is gives you a ton of energy. And I think both extroverts and introverts will feel this, have felt the same way about that. Um, and then I think it's a pace yourself game. So I definitely, um, my first term, which is the, for a lot of people, the hardest and most quantitatively focused, I dropped everything. So like, Josh, I stopped working out. I stopped, you know, like cooking, like any, I just like spent all my time studying and it actually didn't pay off. And I met with a counselor at school just because I was stressed. And he said, well, you've given away all the things that give you energy. So work out, meditate, spend time with friends, make time for those things. And I brought all those things back and did find this balance where I was able to get energy from all of all of the activities. Uh, yeah, I mean, for yeah, I was just gonna say, uh, yeah, yeah, in my case, I found it uh, in incredibly energizing to be to be around the cohort. So I mean, I, I was usually the last one going up the elevator to my room with with somewhere between one or 12 people uh, and not everybody going to my room to our own rooms. Um, and, you know, that that was early on Saturday morning on a lot of occasions. And I had a colleague that would sometimes be there with me, other times not. And we'd get up and go for a run along the uh, bay at like six in the morning, good five miles or something like that. And uh, you know, again, it's always having that balance in life that that manages it. I I certainly uh, physical activity is a big part of it uh, for for keeping me you know on point. And I felt like that that was something we did. And there were a lot of people that would go run over the Bay Bridge and take an Uber back or uh, do some spin classes. Actually, one of the guys was a spin instructor. Uh, so there's a lot of like fun ways to engage and keep that energy up. But I think. Uh, you know, the, the other thing to mention, not just on the weekends, but like throughout the week, uh, and and I'm not sure fully what it was like on the East Coast, but on the West Coast, we have a, a Slack, and it is pretty on fire. Actually, even still to this date, we're, we're in touch on a lot of things. So um, even out of the classroom, uh, there's quite a bit of uh, playful banter and really helpful, like, hey, I'm thinking about this idea. I'm launching this project at work. Uh, or, you know, like, hey, family staff, you know, how is anybody surviving this? Uh, so I think all those things combined, like we're all in it together, really keep help keep the energy level up. And, and we lean on one another. Absolutely. And I think I'm still talking, so I apologize for that. But I think, you know, the other thing that I would mention is when you're representing to your team or your group projects, um, which you can commit to, fully commit to it, and then also represent what you cannot commit to. Um, be, because uh, all you need to do is burn your team once and nobody has time for like soft, gentle letdowns or feedback. They're all difficult conversations right away on how you let the group down. So I think it's fully committing to what's realistic for you and your world. And if it's less because you have a family, you tell people that up front and it is what it is. Uh, mm. I guess I just want to add a quick one for me. One of the reasons why we decided to go together and do it together was because actually it was a good way for us to spend a lot of time together. So one of the idea is like, as long as you are okay, as opposed to going to uh, to um, date night to actually uh, going to dinner and after this study, sitting across the table to study together, then that was at least once or uh, twice a month, actually on Fridays when we were in Wembas, that's actually a good way for us to, to spend some time. and I, and. Um, so that's the first point I wanted to add. And then the second thing I wanted to add was, there is also, as you were saying, like a lot of activities actually happening when we stay over uh, overnight for the weekend. And so we, I have to say that effectively for people who have a family, maybe we don't get to participate fully in all of the um, uh, activities like uh, with the, the cohort. And so that's one of the trade-off that actually we were okay making and, and, and actually actually at the end of the day, it was a good trade-off for us. And what you're hearing is true. It's a 
incredibly collaborative environment and with people from all different areas and backgrounds and industries and functions and they're all fully employed so point being they're not competing for the same jobs at the end of the day everyone really wants to see one another succeed so in the program you all start together and all finish together two years later and i see people go to great lengths to help out their classmates to be successful. Uh, we have a question that comes in about the demands at work. And if any of you could comment on how you managed that and how you managed perhaps your manager to understand the commitments that you're feeling with the program. Sure. Um, so my manager at the time, he had actually encouraged me to apply because of his wonderful experience in the program. And so I'm um, also at my company They're They're very familiar with what this program means and sort of what it, what it means, I guess, from a, um, a commitment perspective. So but I think it's it, I would just say it's like everything else um, we talked about already. It's about communication. Right. And sort of like um, setting, setting community. The, open lines of communication with your leader and your boss about what you can and cannot do um and you know i think one of the the best things i learned um throughout the program was you know to, to ha have high expectations for myself and that's so wonderful that drive is wonderful but to like try to be number one in every single domain at the same time was probably um a, a fast recipe for me to sort of burn out and ultimately fail at all of those things so I actually learned to sort of give myself some grace and patience and, um, you know, do the absolute best that I could and sort of keep my head above water and all these things. Um, and so, I, again, I think it's about communicating, you know, obviously, if, you're, if your employer isn't sort of familiar with the demands of this, you definitely want to chat that through ahead of time. Yeah, I, I was at the same company and am at the same company, but had four different managers during this time. Um, but luckily they were all supportive. And the first one was one of the co-founders of the company who really valued education. And he was excited for me to have a chance to have a little break from work to focus on education. And he had four degrees. And I think because I had his support, it was easier for any other manager who cycled in to just tell them this is something that I'm doing versus it being something where I was asking for permission. I think early on too, I, I was guilty of trying to sneak phone calls in on breaks. And then you sort of look back and you're like, the trade-off's just not worth it. And it becomes more confusing to people to be available maybe than to just not be available. And so it really was a retraining the team that I'm not available. And it, it never, it didn't end up being an issue. Um, I think the only thing I joined was the week that we had marketing week. My company got a new CEO and, and went through some big changes. So I was asked to dial in on a couple of things and stepped out. But to Josh's point about communication with your classmates and your study group, I just let people know what was going on. And um, people were really supportive of me taking some time to step out and do that. But I, I think communication is key. So if you have something big coming up, um, most people want they want to you know your boss and your company want to cheer for your success and then i think the other thing that was really great is that i was able to bring a lot of my learnings from wharton to the company and to my team and so i had in my reviews two of my colleagues direct colleagues would say like they felt like they were benefiting from my education too because of some tools we were able to to just bring and onboard I guess maybe for me it was um, a little bit of a mixed bag in a sense that uh, because of what I was doing uh, on the trading floor, it was very, very important not to have any mistake or any distraction. So very quickly I decided that there was no uh, middle ground basically. When I was gone two Friday a month, I was literally gone. I was even not checking my, my phone to make sure that I didn't try to get to see the urge of getting involved. And so also the flip side was that uh, during the other days of the week, I couldn't do any of the uh, work or project or anything during the week. So I had to spend a little bit more time on the Sundays on the weekend to actually uh, get the work done. So it was a mixed bag. And then when I changed uh, company, 
Oh, that's one of the things that I had to work a little bit on in the fact that my previous company, actually, I had the support from my from the management to be able to take this to Friday on and they understood very well. The new company was a, a discussion that I had to have with them. I tried to do it before joining, but I think it wasn't really clear. But at the end, effectively, they got they understood and they were on board because they could see the, the benefits that I was bringing by being in this program. Yeah, in, in my case, I'm fortunate to have a very supportive bo boss that values education. He actually took seven weeks off over uh, the summer to do a Stanford exec education uh, program. So it was an easy uh, yes for me in that regard. And, you know, that, that help was support from the GM. Um, I, th I think the other thing that or the thing that's super critical here is to be demonstrating value. I think it's drawing those lines and then demonstrate value of what you're bringing back. And uh, despite leading a technical function, I'm, I'm now kind of working my way into a lot of uh, strategy and data science type of initiatives and as a thought leader within the organization. Um, and I'm creating things that I think are gonna generate a lot of value for the firm out of thin air essentially. And I owe that to the program and I think uh, you know our our business unit at Cisco. Uh, you know, hopefully in a in a short short period of time, we'll be really really appreciative of some of the stuff that we're working on. Thanks. Um, and before I get to the next question, I do want to um, let the folks who are watching know that if we don't get to your question, we will respond via email. We do have a record of them, and especially if it's not related to the topic at hand, um, something that Barbara I could answer more directly about your specific case. We'll absolutely get back to you, and we'd also like to encourage you to schedule a chat, which uh, you'll find on our website, so we can speak one-on-one -on -one to you about your, your background. And it looks like there are folks online who are weighing full-time versus executive, and some of you have spouses who did a full-time program, perhaps. So, um, in fact, I know our full-time program has a family club and a partner's club and all that good stuff. So, um, do you feel... Uh, you know, what the benefits were for the executive side. Do you feel like you um, missed out on anything by not doing a, the full-time program? I'll, I'll jump on this one. I mean, I think, uh, so I transitioned from the military about seven years ago, and that was absolutely the time I should have gone to business school, but my wife wanted to be a stay-at-home mom, and I wanted her to have that opportunity, um, and it didn't seem responsible to accrue debt uh, as, as a single, uh, you know, opportunity to be a single earner. So, uh, you know, when I learned of the exec program and that I could do it at Wharton nonetheless, um, that became really exciting for me. And I think, and I, and I think, uh, you know, the amazing parts about it are you have the best faculty and they're incented to come to the West Coast. And almost every faculty that walks in says, I love teaching Wharton exec classes because your um, relative level of uh, experience is just so higher. So, I mean, our case studies, people are like, oh yeah, I was there. I was helping procure this during uh, that particular situation. And I mean, the, the conversation is so rich, like even in, you know, uh, accounting, we're talking about, uh, we had a someone that used to work in, uh, or still works in mobile games, but from Zynga, how they did their accounting practices on the, uh, you know, for Farmville which you know seems like a crazy type of thing but that is brought in a very like detailed level from the class uh so it's pretty exceptional and then i mean uh never mind the fact the folks that are sitting to the left and right of you make you feel like you have no business uh being in the program in the first place um and then again you realize that everybody belongs there and barb and diane do a reasonable job of assembling a cohort uh <laughs> but yeah i mean i i think for for me it was just uh it, it, and then finally access to professors uh is just unbelievable i'm still in touch with one of my professors on on uh, some of these projects i'm working on at, at work right now it's, it's quite remarkable really Um, and for me, I think I said this earlier, but there was never a clear time to step away for two years from my career. I always was doing the work that I wanted to be doing, had the job that I wanted to be doing, and an MBA was more about future growth than anything that I'd done in the past. And I 
I think there was also a ton of value for me in working while I was doing it. Because also, as I mentioned, I just was able to apply things right away. And I saw them, I'm advanced enough in my career where I know where I had struggles. And I had enough experience to know what I really wanted to work on. And I don't know that most traditional MBA students just have that much experience under their belt. And that goes for your cohort too. I mean, you just learn so much from people and everything that they've gone through in their careers. And then also to echo what Josh said, the access that you have to professors and trying to solve the problems that you're trying to solve. And then have it, being at a stage in your career where you may have more direction and where you're trying to go, um, just getting that coaching and guidance, I think to me made, yeah, I just feel so lucky that programs like this exist because it, it made everything make sense for me for an MBA. I guess if I can add a little bit of uh, my experience here in my um, in my field, effectively, uh, we see a lot of people with uh, coming with a full-time MBA, actually even from Wharton. So one of uh, the advantage that they have is like effectively they have this opportunity to do a summer internship that gives them a put into the door as, a, as an associate. The flip side of it is basically for the executive MBA, effectively, you don't have to start at the associate level, you can start much much more uh, in a much more advanced position at the VP level or higher executive director uh, once you do the executive uh, MBA and reason for this is again because we have a lot more experience and and so uh, and so you can actually uh, more or less wave a trade-off here. I also have to say that I really agree with uh, what Chrissy has said and Josh also is that the level of experience that you have in your study team and in the cohort is so much higher than effectively even for we spend a lot less days on campus i have a feeling that with the fact that they are more experienced and they also we spend the, the night and two days with them basically gives us a lot more access to them and it's a lot more enriching as an experience i think as, as far as i'm concerned great well, thank you all. We're just about at time here. The hour has gone quickly. Thank you for sharing your tips, your wisdom, your experience. We encourage you all that are on the line to visit us often on our website. We have a lot more events like this coming up. You'll see even more posted. As Diane mentioned, if you have personal questions about your candidacy, schedule a phone chat. We're out here to help you through this process. So. Thank you all and have a great night. Thank you, Embas. Thank you. <laughs> Appreciate it. Thanks, Diane. Cheers. Bye.